our most gracious Father, what in heaven, King of kings and Lord of lords, we are so much thankful for giving us special moment like this that we may encourage one another, we may learn from one another, and you may equip us to prepare for the great crisis that is coming upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for the Holy Spirit you've given abundantly through your written word and through the experience of life. We pray that you be with us as we go through this class. This humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, so I welcome everyone today. I thank uh, Sister Heber for inviting me to share with us on the Lyme's disease. And this is a disease that is uh, difficult to deal with. Many people are really suffering because of uh, this disease. But I want to tell us that God has a divine plan God has a divine plan for everything, and I call it a restorative plan. His plan never fails, and whenever we stick to his plan, uh, we shall receive a blessing, heavenly blessings, and that is what we want. And all his workers, all medical, gospel medical missionaries, should understand that they should work towards restoring everything. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3 and verses number 21 that uh, Christ will be received in heaven till the restitution of all things. So as gospel medical missionaries, we must be intelligent in regard to disease. It's called prevention and cure. And God is able to give us knowledge all knowledge and wisdom in line with dealing with the disease. So I want to, to share my screen so that we can all read together the Lyme's disease. And this program, or what I'm going to discuss here is recommended, highly recommended for tackling these diseases, typhoid, amoeba, TB or cholera, brucellosis, HIV and AIDS, and other related bacterial, fungal, and viral diseases. And we can adjust it based on specifics here, but the base, the basis uh, treatment of what I'm going to discuss today can be used for all these diseases. I'm going to try to cover the case study is Lyme's disease. That is what I'm going to, to dwell on, how to go about it. But we can use this program in those mentioned diseases. Now, Lyme's disease is caused by the bacterium that is called Borrelia bagdoferi, and is transmitted to humans through the bite of infected black-legged ticks. The tick must be attached to its host for 36 to 48 hours to transmit the bacteria. So it has to take time so that uh, with a bite, it can infuse the bacteria into the bloodstream and it affects you. What we need to know, uh, there are lots that we need to have. When we go to the shrubby areas or grassy areas, we need to be very careful and um, we have to make sure that we check ourselves in order to prevent ourselves from having uh, this tick bone, uh, uh, this vector diseases. It is not only uh, it is not only ticks that can uh, can infuse disease into our system in the hood. There are a lot of uh, disease uh, pathogens that we we can contract when we get to the hoodie areas. And uh, what are the symptoms of Lyme's disease? When someone is having Lyme disease, uh, you may experience fever, chills, headaches, fatigue, muscle and joint aches, 
a swollen lymph nodes or a bullseye rash called erythema migrans, where the spot that has been uh, beaten with the teeth uh, darken. The, you will have a small black spot, but then the redness will, uh, will extend even five centimeters uh, in diameter. And uh, th th this has stages, and depending on the, the skin color, uh, this, it will determine the size. So this is an illustration of Lyme disease on different skin colors. So people with Lyme disease might get a bullseye rash. The rash gradually spreads over a period of days, usually between after three to about 10 days, they will experience the bullseye rash. Now, we have stages of Lyme's disease. Stage number one, we have the early stage with the early symptoms. So early symptoms of Lyme disease usually happen within three to 10 to 30 days after a tick bite. This stage of disease has a limited set of symptoms and this is called early localized disease. It is in a, re in, in a region, in one region, it does not spread. And a rash is a common sign of Lyme disease, but it doesn't always happen. The rash is usually a single cycle that slowly spread from the site of the tick bite. And it may become clear in the center and look like a target or a bullseye. The rash often feels warm to the touch, but is usually not painful or itchy. So that we should need, we need to understand in stage one. What are the other signs? The, uh, the victim will experience fever because the bacteria is infusing the system and a lot of cells are being affected. And so the patient may uh, experience fever, headaches, extreme tiredness, joint stiffness, muscle aches and pains, and swollen lymph nodes because it affects your immune system. In stage two, without treatment, Lyme disease can get worse. The symptoms often show up within three to 10 weeks after a tick bite. In stage two, it's often more serious and widespread. It is called early disseminated disease. So you find that now the bacteria, uh, Borrelia bacteria infused, uh, the bacteria into the system and it is spreading into various tissues or even in some organs, it, be, it becomes so chronic. And the, the symptoms we find are rashes on many other parts of the body, the neck, pain or stiffness, muscle weakness on one or other sides of the face, Immune system in activity, pain that starts from the back and hips and spread to the legs, pain, numbness or weakness in the hands or feet, painful swelling. Then we can have pain, numbness or weakness in the hands or feet, painful swelling in tissues of the eye or eyelid, immune system activity in eye nerves that cause pain or vision loss. So, you find that with the Lyme disease, we have arrayed uh, big uh, symptoms that uh, will affect almost every tissue or organ of the body, if not arrested as early as possible. In stage three, you may have symptoms from the earlier stages and other symptoms. This stage is called late disseminated disease. And we find that in the United States of America, the most common condition of this stage is arthritis in large joints, particularly the knees. Pain, swelling, or stiffness may last for a long time, or the symptoms may come and go. In stage three, symptoms usually begin two 
to 12 months after Attic birth. So it is something that is now stationed in, uh, uh, in the body and almost as attacked um, the major organs of the body. And more so it affects the limb, the lymphatic system. So later signs and symptoms, days to months after tick bites, severe headache and neck stiffness, additional bullseye rashes on the other areas of the body, arthritis with severe joint pain. You can have Bell's palsy where one side of your, uh, your facial nerves are contracted and so you cannot turn on that side. It attacks the other side plus the neck region so that your face become fixed. Intermittent pain in tendon, muscles, joints, and bones. You may have heart palpitations or an irregular heartbeat called Lyme cardiitis. Episodes of dizziness or shortness of breath, which means the oxygen levels, because a lot of cells are being are, are dying, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, pus formation within the cells, you find that the circulation of, ble of blood is hindered and the person is having shortness of breath. It may attack the lung muscles or the cells in the lungs. The inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, someone may end up even having uh, meningitis. Someone may have multiple sclerosis or even Parkinson's disease. You may have nerve pain, shooting pains, numbness or tingling in the hands or feet and problems with short-term memory because it is affecting your brain cells. So what is Lyme cardiitis? Uh, it is, cardiitis means inflammation of the heart muscles. So in Lyme disease, the infection, the bacteria affects the muscles of your heart you will experience the heart problem. And it occurs when the Lyme disease bacteria enter the tissues of the heart, the result is something physicians call heart block, which can be mild, moderate, or severe. So when your blood is constricted, and no, now the blood cannot be supplied to the major arteries on your heart, you will have a problem. You may even have a heart attack. So how common is Lyme's uh, cardiitis? Based on national surveillance data from 2001 to 2010, Lyme cardiitis occurs in approximately 1% of Lyme disease cases. So it means it is something that is not, not that every person who has a Lyme disease will have affected heart. So Lyme disease statistics. Lyme disease is the most common reported vector-borne illness in the United States, more so in the woody areas or forested area. This disease does not occur nationwide and is concentrated heavily in the Northeast and Upper Mideast. Each year, approximately 30,000 cases of Lyme disease are reported to CDC by state health department. So it means it is a menace, an epid uh, uh, epidemic um, in the areas that are woody or uh, are forested or areas where they keep uh, the, the pets and also uh, maybe the cattle, horses, the moors, they have a lot of these prevalences. So uh, in the world, the red zones are endemic occurrences, areas where most uh, we will find a lot of people affected. The, the areas that are green, they are, they are not documented uh, occurrences, yet you'll find it in Africa, it is not an endemic. Um, yet in some other areas of the world, it is something that 
affects a lot of people. In Europe, you see a lot of people in Middle East, in, in Asia, in Europe, there are no cases that are being uh, uh, actually occurrences, but they do happen. So we find the this but this tick or the bacteria, sorry, the bacteria that is through the the black legged tick infused into this when it bites a person and it fuses uh, that bacteria into the system. The bacteria has three stages. And this is what will make us to be successful in dealing with any bacterial infection or viral infection in the system. We must understand the stages in which the, uh, this bacteria progresses in the system. So the US CDC estimates that over, 30, over 300 new Lyme disease cases occur annually in the US alone. We say nothing of Europe and Asia, and Lyme disease is estimated to incur almost 1 billion USD per year in healthcare costs. So a lot of, a lot of finances, funds are taken into the areas that are affected. It means it is a menace in those areas. So <clears throat> what are some of the medical treatments that are available for Lyme disease? This is what people will want to know. That uh, okay, so what are the medical treatments that are available? Patients treated with appropriate antibiotics. So mostly the antibiotics is what is used to help uh, to help in dealing with this disease. Uh, so in early stages of Lyme disease, those use antibiotics they recover. And in late stages, it becomes very difficult to deal with it. Antibiotics commonly used for oral treatment include doxycycline, amoxicillin, amoxicillin, or sephurozyme acetide. And patients with certain neurological or cardiac forms of illness may require intravenous treatment with drugs such as cetriaxone or penicillin. So if this is what the medical world uses and some with success on the early uh, disseminated stage, then we need to be more smarter than they and analyzing this antibiotic that are used, we look for the better natural remedial agencies, antibiotics, that we can make a formula of and then extract them, then we can use them to fight uh, Lyme's disease, the bacteria, whether it is early stage or late stage. So long as we master and know how the, the bacteria, uh, the bacteria develops the stages in which it develops and how it, uh, it, uh, it progresses in the system, we can find a way, we can make a formula that is going to, bl to block the bacterial uh, spread in the system. And it's very easy based on what you understand in this study here. So, what is post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? It is not uncommon for patients treated for Lyme disease with a recommended uh, two to four week course of antibiotics to have lingering symptoms of fatigue, pain of joint and muscle aches at the time they finish treatment. In a small percentage of cases, these symptoms can last for more than six months. Although sometimes called chronic Lyme disease, this condition is properly known as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And we are going to find that those who've been in, on antibiotics, sometimes they experience this, the symptoms of Lyme disease, yet it is not the Lyme disease 
affecting them, but it is the, uh, the side effects of the antibiotics that they use. That is what has been found out on post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, because most people have been on antibiotics over and over again until it has affected their system. Their immune system is so low that now the drugs affect them and the bacteria still continue to develop in their system. So what causes uh, the post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? The exact cause is not yet known. Most medical experts believe that the lingering symptoms are the result of residual damage to tissues and the immune system that occur during the infection. That is what CDC says. But the real issue is those antibiotics used affect the immune system and make the person vulnerable to many of those signs and uh, side effects of the drugs and the person becomes so weak. So we have doxycycline that is used. And what are the side effects of this antibiotic that is commonly used for Lyme's disease? Severe headaches, dizziness, blood vision, fever, chills, body aches, flu symptoms, swollen glands, urinating less than usual or not at all, the person experienced diarrhea, that is watery or bloody, pale or yellowed skin, severe pain in your upper stomach, loss of appetite, jaundice, severe skin reaction. So we have these side effects that are a kind, almost alike to these symptoms of Lyme's disease. So it makes you worse. We have the amoxicycline, uh, amoxicycline, which makes you to have white patches or sore inside your mouth or on your lips, fever, swollen glands, rash or itching, joint pain, or generally ill feeling, pale or yellowed skin. You may have severe tingling, numbness, pain, muscle weakness, almost alike to the symptoms of Lyme's disease. You'll have easy bruising, usually bleeding. You have hemorrhages that cannot be stopped. You have severe, severe skin reaction. You may have allergies that you use not to have when you are on these antibiotics. What about the side effects of cefurozyme uh, uh, acetyl? Nausea, vomiting, stomach pain. You can have cough, stuffy nose, stiff or tight muscles or muscle pain, joint pain or swelling, headache, drowsiness, feeling restless, irritable or hyperactive, and you have white patches or so inside your mouth or on your lips. Diaperage, if it is an infant taking liquid, uh, sephorosine, and vaginal itching or discharge for women. So you see, we have a lot of signs and symptoms. And if you compare the side effects of the drugs used and the late signs and symptoms of Lyme disease, you find they are almost alike. Severe headaches and neck stiffness, additional bullseye rashes on other areas of the body, arthritis with severe joint pain and swelling, facial or belt palsy, intermittent pain in tendons, heart palpitations, and a lot of uh, this that we had mentioned before. So we can conclude that Lyme disease is caused by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. The tick must be attached to its host for 36 to 48 hours to transmit the bacteria. And there are only an average of 30,000 confirmed cases of Lyme disease annually. There could be as many as 300, according to estimated from estimations from studies. Then what, is, what we need to know is that the symptoms of late stage Lyme disease could be as a result of antibiotic usage. That is the, the truth of the matter. So what should we do? We avoid the drugs 
antibiotics that do not cure. Actually, we find that many people are suffering from uh, chronic diseases because of the antibiotics that they are taking that has wiped off the good bacteria in the system. And once those bacteria is not there, if we have the condition called this bios, this biopsis, that means the imbalance of the bacteria in your system, then your immune system is weakened and you cannot fight any disease. The first thing that we need to do as uh, physicians is to make sure that there is good bacteria, good uh, 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 good population of bacteria in your system that will help you to fight any other uh, strain of bacteria that is not, uh, cannot, the body is not accepting. Another thing we need to understand is our immune system has to be uh, strengthened in order to fight any pathogen that gets into it. So are antibiotics even effective for Lyme's disease? So what we need to know that these uh, bacteria from the tick as a complex life cycle, and this is why it is so difficult to deal with and can exist in radically different forms in spirochetes or uh, spiro, spiroblasts or in L form, which lacks a cell wall, round bodies or cyst form, which allows for dormancy and escaping PCR detection and highly antibiotic resistant biofilms. So this is now the gist of the matter. This is, if you understand this, then you will eliminate Lyme's disease. You must understand the stages. It is a, a gram negative bacteria. We, you know, we have the gram positive bacteria. It means they have, uh, they have cell walls that are a little bit large. And uh, those are very easy to eliminate, but the bacteria that are lacking cell walls and are always operating in groups, is very difficult to eliminate because they can uh, they can go into dormancy. When they detect that you're using antibiotic, the bacteria goes into dorm dormancy. It doesn't release any toxin because most of the drugs, antibiotics that are outside there, uh, some are meant to wipe out the toxins that the bacteria releases. When the bacteria release the toxin, that is what intoxicates your cells and you will, ex you will experience uh, symptoms like fever, joint pains, and uh, a lot of weakness, fatigue. But now this bacteria, the Lyme disease bacteria is very wise. It is having a spirochetes. Spirochetes is like something like a tendril that it grasps into the cell and then it forms a kind of a, a, a cocoon, a house of itself and protects itself so that even if you take any drug, any antibiotic, it cannot break the cell wall. So it continues to multiply in this small house it has formed and, uh, and, and, and you will not be able to eliminate it. So this pleformic property makes conventional treatment exceptionally difficult because while some conventional antibiotics are effective against forms with a cell wall such as spirochetes, they are ineffective against those without a cell wall. So most of the antibiotics fight against the bacteria that has the cell wall, but those that have no cell wall like uh, this bacteria is very difficult to eliminate. So you must think otherwise. You must think of another way of attacking it and eliminating it in the system. So this, uh, the complexity of Lyme disease is that it, this enables uh, the B bacteria to change form to evade eradication through conventional means. Biofilm formation. Biofilm simply means 
it forms a thick lining that protects the bacteria underneath so that it cannot be eliminated. So this biofilm formation creates a significant barrier against most conventional antibiotics, even when used in combination and has been recently suggested to be the most effective mechanism of resistance. So this is how it happens. It forms, it attaches itself, then it forms a micro colony. The bacteria, uh, the, 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 the Lyme disease bacteria comes together, they form a colony, and then they form a matrix, something that protects them. And while they're under that protection, whichever drug you supply cannot be able to penetrate into this. It is like cancer. If you've seen cancer, a tumor, it develops a hard cover, something that is like a plastic covering it that even water cannot infuse or diffuse in inside it. Then in and, and then when it has formed that matrix, you'll find that uh, in that small surrounding, in that small surrounding, the bacteria is attached to this uh, to the to the cell itself, the body cell itself. So it gets its food, yet the surrounding environment cannot, you cannot manage to penetrate into this matrix. So once they have matured, they spread again. And this is why it becomes very difficult to destroy the Lyme disease bacteria. So if we understand these stages, then we can come up with a, pro, uh, with a protocol treatment that helps to eradicate it from the biofilm, the house that it has formed, so that it doesn't find a way of dispersing or, or spreading to other parts of the body. So what do we now end up by saying that the real cause of Lyme disease is a weakened immune system. Your immune system is not able to protect you because there are no B cells or the T cells that will fight the pathogen. Then a number two is unhealthy microflora. When your gut system is not well equipped, you will have, uh, you will be vulnerable to any bacterial infection. And then we have inhibited cellular function and protection. When your cells are not properly protected, they don't have their the, 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 the cell wall that is well barricaded or protected, you will be affected by the bacteria. Because you know, bacteria just uh, attack the cell from outside. The virus attacks the cell from inside. That's why viral diseases are the most difficult to eliminate. The bacterial diseases are easy to, uh, to, to eliminate when they have no they have not formed the biofilm or when you have broken the biofilm. So we must build the system. Number one, in the protocol treatment, we, you must make sure that your gut system, which is uh, your first line defense, your first line area of defense, must be well protected, well armed. And how do you do that? You make sure that you have the right lactobacillus, uh, that's the good bacteria in the gut. And the importance of this uh, gut bacteria is that, uh, sorry, 80% of your immune system resides in your gut. So bacteria outnumber your cells 10 to one. It means we have a lot of bacteria in our system to compare to the cells that are in the body. Then 100 trillion bacteria, about two to three pounds worth of bacteria in our system. You should have about 85% good bacteria and 15% bad. That's why when someone dies, it begins rotting from within because the bad bacteria now take effect, they take action because the good bacteria cannot now act in a dead body because it's acidic. 
So beneficial bacteria keep the bad bacteria and the yeast in check. So we need to make sure that we maintain uh, those, the right population of the good bacteria. Produce nutrients your body needs, such as B vitamins. So that's the importance. And then there is also another factor here that is called bacterial phages. These are beneficial viruses in your body. So this just marvelous how God really has made this body. So we have the bacteria. We have the virus that resides inside the bacteria and they act as a controlling element within the bacteria so that whenever the bacteria discharges the toxins, these viruses protect the body from uh, and uh, protect the, uh, the the cells from allowing the bacteria, the bad bacteria, to release those toxins into the cell. And they outnumber your body bacteria in the ratio ten to one. What one? What a marvelous, wonderful thing! So roughly four quadrillion viruses in your body. We have a body that is full of the good bacteria and the good viruses, and we have the bad viruses and the good viruses. So Dr. Philip say, Sharp says that viral elements are a large part of the genetic material of almost all organisms. We humans are well over 50% viral. So we have those viruses residing in our system. Function of your gut flora, digestion and absorption of carbohydrates, production of vitamins, absorption of minerals, elimination of toxins, distinguish between pathogens and non-harmful antigens. So if the good bacteria is in your system, they are able to eliminate the pathogens. If you have low population of the good bacteria, the, the, the harmful pathogens or bacteria or viruses will take uh, that advantage and bring you down. So keep harmful bacteria under control aid in production of antibodies to pathogens and provide support to the immune system. This is something that we need to make sure that we, uh, we boost our gut bacteria. And you know, one of the natural ways of boosting the gut bacteria is taking a lot of dark green leafy vegetables, a lot of fruits, and taking garlic and flaxseed is so helpful in creating a probiotic environment that is going to help your system to, uh, to culture a lot of good bacteria. Garlic and flaxseed and taking a lot of that green leafy vegetables. Avoid disruption to your microflora and immune system by avoiding vaccinations, antibiotics, medication, or processed foods. When you take processed foods, you are vulnerable to attack by any bacteria because your system is not able to feed the, the good bacteria and even eliminate the good bacteria in your system. What are the medications that dis disrupt your microflora? microflora? Antibiotics, anti antacids, bath control pills, steroids, and uh, over-the-counter drug NSAIDs, antidepressants, and statins, the heart-related uh, drugs. So how do you optimize your gut flora? Organic plant-based diet, healthy fats, and, and all, or usually eat the food that are in season because when the foods are in season, they maximize the nutrients uh, they, 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 they have a lot of nutri, nutri, nutriment that can get into your body. They make use of the season of that time and gather all the nutrients from the soil that are needful for your body. Ferment, healthy fats such as coconut oil and olive oil, fermented vegetables, probiotic supplements, juice, vegetables, blend fruits, raw dairy, Omega-3, sorry, that one passed my mind. Raw dairy, 
I don't recommend it for our, for our system. Then we have soy yogurt, where you make the soy milk, and then after making the soy milk, you, you put a probiotic. You can put any probiotic that you have, about maybe two capsules of probiotic for a cup, and then you put it in a warm environment, allow it to culture for about 24 hours. And the soy protein is so helpful in helping your gut bacteria to multiply. So it helps promote growth of beneficial bacteria, supports healthy immune function. It helps increase vitamin B, omega-3 digestive enzyme and lactase or lactic acid. What are some of the best drugs perhaps you can use? Stevia. Stevia is known to be very beneficial in dealing with the Lyme disease. Stevia whole leaf extract as an individual agent was effective against all non-morphological forms of B. bagdoferi. It means it destroys the Lyme disease biofilm. The small micro colonies that they form if you take stevia, it is able to destroy, to destroy the bacteria. The leaf extract of stevia possesses many phytochemicals, which include uh, ostroinolin or B, uh, uh, beta -car carotene, uh, dulcoside or nilacin. The role of this compound is mainly to protect the plant from microbial infection and adverse environment conditions. So you need to take a lot of stevia. You can juice it up. If you can juice a half, of gla a half a glass and then you top it up with clean water, soft water, and then you take about three cups a day, that will be a good dosage for suppressing and eliminating this bacteria. So the researchers exposed stevia potential effectiveness against B. bacteria cultures and comparing it to three common antibiotics sometimes used to treat Lyme disease, doxycycline, cefoperazone, or deptomycin, as well as their combination. The study found that the most antibiotic resistant form of B. bacteria, the biofilm form, actually increased in mass when individual antibiotics were administered. Stevia, on the other hand, reduce the biofilm mass on both tested surfaces for plastic or collagen by about 40%. So stevia is so powerful in dealing with the Lyme disease. So what are the combination you can make against Lyme disease? Six parts of stevia, four parts liquorice root, four parts pork root, two parts ginger root, two parts clove powder, two parts turmeric powder. And uh, uh, one of the most uh, broad spectrum antibacterial I've been using in dealing with a lot of bacterial diseases is cinnamon. Cinnamon is super in dealing with viral diseases, even HIV. So you will put about two parts of cinnamon powder there and then mix all together Add into distilled water, about two liters, allow to settle overnight. When you allow it to settle overnight, it will, dis, uh, it will be dissolved. Uh, the, the medicinal components will dissolve into the distilled water. And then in the morning, simmer until reduced to a half the volume. Then you get a strainer. Don't use a sieve. Have a strainer, a, a, a cloth. Then you strain it out, so you squeeze it out. You can check a muslin cloth. Then you add, after you strain it, add 250 ml blackstrap molasses. And then simmer for eight minutes. Let it cool down and store in a dark bottle. Then you take a half a glass twice a day. Now, I want to tell us that most of the times we get, we don't get results with the natural remedies because we don't know how to extract them powerfully. 
we don't maintain the right potency that is needed. So the more we concentrate it, the more it is going to be very helpful in the system. And then you need to understand how to drive the medicinal properties into the system. You know that when you use ginger, it is a lead herb that takes the medicinal properties into the cell. If you use cayenne pepper, it is going to stimulate the circulation of blood to every part of the organ and the tissues. And if you use um, if you use blackstock molasses that has iron, you know that every blood vessel, every uh, blood corpuscle, that is the red corpuscle, so red blood cells, are craving for iron, iron phos uh, phosphate that it attaches into it to make hemoglobin. So you want to combine your herbs with these accentuators, the things that are going to make your medicinal properties to get into the tissues so that it meets the target. So I put black stop molasses so, so that the ion that is in it is going to make it flow into the bloodstream very easily. And once the ion is present and the ion is the, is the core mineral in the, for the hemoglobin, it means that everything that you combine with it will get inside the cell. So take one teaspoon colloidal silver twice a day for 21 days. Colloidal silver is a powerful antibacterial. You can put it in a, a half a glass of drinking water or in juice. Take one teaspoon hydrogen peroxide, 35% wood grade, twice a day for 21 days. Then take one teaspoon iodine solution once per day for 14 days. Iodine solution is a good bacterial, antibacterial. Then you can take 5% allicin or 30 grams twice a day for 21 days. Now, allicin is gotten from, uh, is gotten from, um, how do you call it? It's gotten from garlic. Now, if you cannot get the extract of allicin, you can make like a half a glass of the juice of garlic, fresh garlic, then you top up with, the, with, with lemon, lemon juice. And then you put about, uh, you grate or have about two tablespoons of ginger, you mix together and then take in on a, a, a two hours after eating. In the morning and evening, you will be able to fight bacteria. Allicin, uh, garlic is known to destroy the biofilms of every bacteria. Because of the high sulfur that it has, it is able to destroy any toxin that is released by the bacteria and also affect the supply of nutrients to the, bacteria, uh, to the micro colony of the bacteria. Some of the essential oils you want to use is clove oil. Try adding eight drops of clove essential oil per two tablespoons of coconut oil and apply it throughout your body before hiking and spending time outdoors. So you will make an oil that a liniment that you apply on the body. If you have the, the bite of the, of the tick, you will apply it on that area and it's going to uh, to help you. Oregano oil. You know that oregano is a very powerful antiviral, antibacterial uh, drug um, remedy. Whether using it raw in food or using its oil, it kills the gram negative, both gram negative and positive. Those with the cells, cell walls, and those without cell walls, it is able to destroy all the bacteria strains, uh, the bad bacteria strain. Then we have uh, vetiver. So the vetiver essential oils, you will mix 30 drops of vetiver in 16 ounces of spray bottle with a tap water. Spray around the openings 
to your homes, windows, doors, use diluted topically with cloth to help eradicate any tick. You can also apply it on your skin. So garlic is known to help destroy the gram negative bacteria. So you need to take a lot of garlic. Black seed oil is very important. The black seeds is antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, anti-ulcer, anti-fungal, antioxidant, antiviral. You need to take about one teaspoon three times a day. If you have uh, the late signs or advanced stages of Lyme's disease. Turmeric is a commonly used spice throughout the world and has been shown to exhibit anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, antioxidant, and anti-neoplastic properties. It helps to regrow new cells. It detoxify the system and neutralize the toxins from the bacteria itself. Then you need omega-3 fats, the flax seeds, the chia seeds, the black seeds, tender bamboo shoots. Bamboo shoots have a lot of omega-3. You know, here in, in, in Uganda, we have a bamboo shoot that is eaten. It is a, a fish substitute. It smells like fish. <laughs> so interesting. We loved it here. And I used to give it to my wife when she was expectant because of the high omega-3 that it has. And it helps when you give you when you give it to an expectant woman, the woman will be strong and the child will not lack in iodine as well as in omega-3. It's a complete, a complete, uh, complete food in itself. Then we have pumpkin flesh. You eat it, you can juice it up or cook it or blend it up, make a smoothie out of it and eat it. Soybeans have omega-3 parsley or vine spinach, what we call malaba spinach, is very helpful. You need iodine. So iodine is going to start metabolism in your system. Whenever iodine is, the metabolism or the process of breaking down food into the cells is very rapid. So you need foods that are rich in iodine. At the same time, it stabilizes, uh, it, it helps in the stabilization of metabolism and body weight, optimization of your immune system. It is a potent antibacterial, antiparasitic, antiviral, and anti-cancer agent. We use iodine solution for HIV and AIDS patients. We also use it for any bacterial, or viral, or fungal infection, and it helps a great deal. So you need to take seaweeds, uh, kelp will be helpful in, uh, in fixing the iron deficiency. And we need to know a certain uh, kind of food called carnitine, foods with carnitine. So Lyme's disease is a, uh, is a serious infectious disease. Carnitine plays a crucial role in metabolism and inflammatory response. Carnitine may be important in improving neurological dysfunction and loss of neurons. So which foods have carnitine? Seafoods, nuts, seeds, artichokes, asparagus, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, garlic, and mustard greens. You need to take a lot of them, juicing them, and taking them during the program to help you deal with advanced stages of Lyme's disease. Increase your vitamin C intake. Take natural sources, oranges, red peppers, kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, strawberries, grapefruit, guava, kiwi, green peppers. In Kenya, we use tamarind. Tamarind is a single fruit that has high levels volumes of vitamin C, units of vitamin C. 
there is an HIV patient who did not go for antiretrovirals, but had been taking tamarind tea alone. When she goes for a test, the viral loads are very low, just with tamarind alone. It, is, it boosts your T alpha cells 900 times percent, 900 percent. It means it boosts if where there was there 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 used to be one T alpha cell, it boosts it to nine T alpha cells. It multiplies, so it is very helpful, even in cancer cases. The tamarind Lyme disease protocol for thirty days: do colon cleanse. You can do an enema or no enema cleanse. You take five hundred meals of citrus fruit concentrate daily or capsules, 5,000 units, three times a day. Use tamarind tea, very potent. You should be in vitamin, uh, you, can, you should take vitamin D or be in the sun in the morning hours, in the evening. Take distilled water, two liters per day. Take herbal combo, that is six parts stevia, four parts licorice root, four parts pork root, three parts cinnamon powder, two parts ginger root, two parts moringa leaf, two parts turmeric, two parts clove powder, and two parts oregano. This is a sure bet for dealing with any bacterial infection and will eliminate the Lyme's disease. So what is the Lyme? body liniment, something to apply on the affected area, the skin. 100 mils olive oil, 100 grams shea butter, 100 grams Bwax, 10 mils of clove essential oil, 30 mils stevia infused oil, 30 mils black seed oil, 10 mils oregano oil, 10 mils lavender oil, 10 mils lemongrass essential oils. Melt the Bwax, then you set it aside after it has melted, then you add all the ingredients mentioned above. You stir it slowly as it cools, and then pour it in a mason jar, then allow it to cool. Apply on the skin after bathing. It will be able to, uh, to uh, help your body not to uh, continue having the rush. So maintain colloidal silver, the hydrogen peroxide and iodine solution, and the garlic, the 5% alicine, every day. Drink three glasses of vegetable juice daily. Drink three glasses apple juice daily. Apple juice is known to prevent the gram, positive, the gram negative and positive spread. You need to take a lot of apple juice. You should take 80% raw food with small portions of carbohydrates. Why? Because where we, when we have sugar in the system, the bacteria will be able to spread a lot. So you need to monitor your carbohydrate intake. Also proteins, you need to take limited amount of protein when you're dealing with the bacterial infection. Because the bacteria use the, the proteins to make their, uh, their colony to, proper, uh, to continue uh, producing in the system, progressing in the system. So you need to limit in, unto even a half the amount you usually take. Carbohydrates the same. You need to take a lot of vitamins and minerals instead. So change up all components weekly. I was trying to, to state, uh, to list some how you can, what you can change from. If you have these varieties, you can change uh, so that the bacteria do not get used to the medicine or the drugs you're using. So this is very powerful. I think I've shared the, the PowerPoint in the, in the forum. I think we can go through it. So if you can get all this, alternate them so that uh, you don't the, the bacteria don't uh, mutate and continue to spread in the system.
You can have Russian penicillin, three grapefruit washed and sliced, two onions chopped, two to three lemons, two garlic bars, a third teaspoon cayenne pepper. You add one and a half to two cups water boiling. Let it boil for 15 to 20 minutes covered. It will become very bitter. Then you strain it. You can drink a little every 20 minutes variation. You can simmer the fruit in a little water first, then add the boiling water. Then you take three tablespoons a day for 21 days. So this Russian penicillin is very helpful in dealing with the, with the B. bugdoferi, the Lyme disease bacteria. Vegetarian penicillin, we have garlic, vitamin C, lemon juice, cayenne, onion, echinacea, yarrow. You made into three cups of water to make tea. Take a half a cup five times a day. That will help you to fight the disease. And, and that is what we have for today. May God bless us. Yes. We Thank can you pray so to much, end. Brother. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that was much nice uh, information. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so my uh, one, my first question is, uh, uh, is it because you are going mostly barefoot that you get uh, these ticks on you or they can fall down from the trees? They can fall down from the trees or, or maybe when you are hiding or uh, or looking after the, the cattle, if you get into contact with most of these pets in the affected area, you know they are carriers. They 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 the tick easily attach into the feathers, into the the skin of these animals, and also areas where they they graze, that tick can attach itself into the grass areas or into the uh, shrub, shrubby areas. So when you walk along, it can stick into your, into your skin, into your cloth, and then it, uh, it, 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 it finds its way into your skin. <clears throat> so have you ever been bitten or uh, bitten yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I was a, a herdsman. I know this. Sometimes you would find ticks on the um on your loins <laughs> so what so are, what is, what is the experience in, what is so the it was not causing sorry. life disease so what is the first thing you are doing but you don't have so, all that rest you know all these things you are uh, suggesting would it help mm -hmm. to take steva extract oregano turmeric and iodine I think that is, you know, what most people maybe have in their home. Yes, if you have that, you can do that with a good um, uh, nutrition program, taking fruits and juices, just making sure that uh, you don't flood your system with a lot of sugars. You just maintain a good veg uh, vegetarian diet, high in vegetables and fruits, and you limit, uh, you limit the carbohydrates and proteins, and then take the any remedy you can find uh, amongst those ones I've mentioned. Right. <clears throat> so, just to repeat, is there some kind of poultice you can use? You know, if you discover that oh, I got bitten, you know, within the first forty hours. Yeah, you can use flaxseed and charcoal poultice. You can use garlic poultice. You just grate garlic and you smear, you, you, you mix it with some, uh, you mix it with some oil, it can be olive oil, and apply on that area. You can get plantain. If you have plantain around, you can smear the, you can put the plantain poultice there. If you have burdock, you can use burdock. There are many, many herbs you can use to extract the poison. Anything you can use for snake bites, you can use for the tick bites. But if the tick is first, you have to get the tick out, right? 
because yeah you have to remove the tick out yeah right. then you apply the poultice you know when i was a little girl we went barefoot i you know i didn't hear about lyme disease before you know maybe i was 30 35 years old you know it was mm -hmm. not a problem so uh is it true that you know these uh, ticks are actually uh that they are made they are sent out from uh, i don't remember now somewhere around new york or is uh maybe uh, do you know it's actually not natural i mean maybe natural is not the right word it's created to make us sick yeah sure that is happening all over the world today you know we have a lot of chemtrails around and uh, most areas uh, mo most areas are affected agricultural systems are affected we have a lot of pests that were not there before man can create it and uh, mostly when they have a target with a certain population or a certain area right <clears throat> so have you seen that the person have had lime for a long time and this lime this these ticks are really hiding very well in this uh, uh sacks or what you call them is it still possible to come in and kill them yeah once they have gone to the system just yes, i've told you using cinnamon and garlic and using onion using burdock uh, using stevia is able to destroy they are those microfilm, the small micro colony that they have. And also uh, changing your diet, making sure that you don't feed them by eliminating sugar and any fat that can feed the system with a lot of, uh, may increase the sugar levels in your body so that they get what to eat may also help. So you have to make sure that once you've suspected that you have it, you go on a period, maybe 21 days of limited or no, uh, no carbohydrates and a little protein for your diet so that you don't feed them. That will really help. And also doing things like uh, hot foot baths, fever baths, to start circulation of blood so that the blood is able to supply the 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 immune cells that will be able to fight any pathogen in the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> and then um, you were uh, saying something about how much stevia extract. Can you please repeat how much stevia extract every day? I said you can use it half half a glass. Then you top up, you top it up with plain water. And then you take three cups a day. Okay. Thank you. So I don't know uh, uh, if someone else has uh, some questions or comments for you. You're welcome to ask. It's nice to have you with us, Yarel Kirva. Yeah, Brother Vern. Hello, it's Barb here. Um, I had a quick question um, asking how to safely remove the ticks. And the other thing is that my understanding is that not every tick carries the bacteria. Yes. So now to to remove it, my dad was sitting on a grassy area one time and he had a, a tick and it actually attached to his um, to his scrotum and he had to go to the hospital and get it surgically removed. And it that one did not have the we call it Rocky Mountain fever did not give the Rocky Mountain fever because it didn't contain the bacteria. But um, yeah, so how would you remove it? Some people say burn it with a match, but then if you burn it with a match, is it not going to extract more poison or bacteria into your body? And also, some people will say smother it with some oil so that it um, can't breathe, like can't. The rest of the body is not completely inside, like 
I can know they can burrow right inside. I've seen that before where you can burrow under the skin into this, like through the skin if they get really, if you don't notice it. Anyways. Yeah, so usually um, you can pull it out slowly, but you know, some, some mouth parts may remain. So uh, you need to, to check really well and uh, you make sure that you remove the old part. And if you're not able to, to remove the old part, then what you need to do, you can tie a poultice of, uh, of ginger, a tie a poultice of ginger. If you're not, if you're sure you've not uh, inspected and seen any mouth part remaining, put a poultice of ginger to help pull out any part that may have remained. Irish potato is also used for that in pulling out any mouth part of maybe a tick or a sting of a bee that has remained. And it's so helpful and it protects you a lot. Or another thing that helps in pulling is bentonite clay. If you have bentonite clay with you, you put it as a poultice, it's able to pull it uh, out and neutralize any toxin that might have remained at an early stage. Thank you very much. So bentonita clay and ginger poultice. Can you combine the two of them in a poultice? Say Thank shred some ginger. I'm sorry, shred some ginger and then um, get it wet with the clay. clay. Uh, yeah, put the two in together. Yes, you can. You can, no problem. Okay. Otherwise, um, <clears throat> let's close with a prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for our brother Wycliffe and everything you have been teaching him and that he is willing to share with us, Lord. And we we're so thankful that there are natural things we can use if we get this tick bite. And we pray most of all that you will protect us from not getting it. But if we should get it, Lord, we pray that you will help us to know what to do uh, right there and then. And remember what we have been learning today and that you will teach others. We praise you that you are uh, the healer. And that we can, that you want to cooperate with us. We pray that you will give us wisdom. Thank you for blessing, uh, Brother uh, Wycliffe and everyone here, Lord. And uh, help us to have your peace and your joy, knowing that you are with us every day until you are coming back. We praise and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.